So today's class is dedicated in honor of the first yard site of Hana Chana Bas Reb David Zechreina Levracha, a woman of tremendous chesed and kindness, generosity and benevolence, dedicated by her daughter and grandson from Sydney, Australia. Thank you to Hayd Nishmas Atzura B'Tzur HaChayim. It's also dedicated La'Ela Nishmas, Harav Reb Uriel, Ravnoi Zechreina Levracha, dedicated by his father and the entire family, dedicated by Dr. Reb Shaltiel, Ze'ev Ravnoi and the entire family, in loving memory of his son, Reb Ariel Ravnoi, who was actually a student of mine many years ago, a special young man who passed away young, in tribute to his yard site on the eighth day of Shvat. Thank you. I miss him. Also dedicated, L'Zeche Nishmas, Reb Chaim, Reb Michal, Reb Chaim Weldler, in honor of his 20th yard site on the 12th day of Shvat, yesterday, Yud Beis Shvat, Tehei Nishmas Etzur Reb Etzur HaChaim, may they remain eternal sources of light, blessing, and inspiration for you, their families, and all of Klal Yisrael, and thank you very much. It's just maybe a lack of that. Oh, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Today we're going to take a story that at the surface it looks like one story, but if you dig a little deeper, a whole other story gets revealed and unveiled. And the story has particularly very practical and profound relevance to our times, as we will see. It gives us the perspective of Yiddishkeit, true, authentic Yiddishkeit. How do we look at another person, how we feel and empathize with another person? And I think will give us at least a little perspective on how, on how we view our soldiers, the Israeli soldiers, fighting now in Gaza. So let's begin. These are very famous Pesukim Parshas B'Shalach tells the story of Kriyas Yamsov. At last the Jewish people have been freed from slavery and bondage where they were in Egypt for 210 years. Every tyrant ultimately has his day. Every dictator, every government and regime based on abuse and evil and horror and bloodshed and violence and oppression. They sow hatred and violence. They create bloodshed and tragedy. They destroy many lives, but ultimately evil is not eternal. It comes to an end. And Moshe is told to come to Pare and said and say to him, your time has come. Your game is over. But as uh, Yogi Berra said, it's not over till it's over. So it wasn't over yet till it was over. Huh? <laughs> In this case, till the Jews sang. Az <laughs> Yashem Moshe. And the Parshas B'Shalach, it's finally over. In the sense that the Egyptians who let the Jews leave regret it. Pari regrets his decision and he chases and pursues the Jews who are now stuck between a rock and a hardball. In front, in front of them is the Yams of the Red Sea. Behind them are the Egyptian troops. And the Torah says, Pare takes 600 of Rechev Bachar, the choicest of chariots, the best soldiers, his greatest commanders, and many warriors to pursue the Hebrew slaves and bring them back to Egypt so they could continue to serve them as slaves. And of course, we all know the continuation of the story. Moshe, the Jewish people scream to Moshe, Moshe screams to Hashem, Hashem says, why are you screaming? It's time to travel. Let's see how the Torah describes the story of the parting of the sea. And it's such a uh, central story in Jewish history that we say it every day in Shachras. Before Yishtabach, we mention the story and then we go through the entire song that the Jews sang after it. So it's B'Shalach Perik Yidalet Pasuk Tesvav, that's Exodus 14, 
chapter 14, verse 15. You have it here, the first source sheet. Hashem tells Moshe, why are you screaming to me? It's not a time, as Rashi says, it's not a time to scream and cry. It's a time to travel. Speak to the Jewish people, the Yisrael. Move on. You're on a journey. Continue. Don't stop. But, very nice, but there's a sea. <laughs> right? It's a sea. I mean, we could continue the journey, but to where? We're going to all die. So he says, now. This is your job. Lift your stick. And stretch out, extend your hand, your arm over the sea. Ufka'eyu and split it. V'yavoyu b'nei Yisrael b'seicha yam b'yabasha. Let the Jewish people enter into the yam, but it will be b'yabasha, it will be dry land. And that's what indeed happens. Pasach hafale v'yait Moshe, s'yadi ala yam, Moshe extends his hand on the sea. V'yoylech ha'ashem es hayam b'ruch kadem aza kala layla v'yasem es hayam l'charave v'yibaku ha'mayim. Entire night, an eastern wind, an eastern wind was blowing and it parted the sea, it becomes dry, and then the Vayibaku, Vayibaku means the sea, the water split, it's split into, into two, so there's a pathway. The Jewish people enter into the Yam, into the sea, but by Yabasha, in dry land, because it's split. So they're actually in the space of the sea, in the cavity, in the depth, but it's by Yabasha. And the water, supernaturally becomes a chayma, becomes a fortress, a wall from the right side and from the left side. So it's not just the water parted, but there's now two walls, a chayma on both sides. This is actually the story. This is the story. The sea parted, the Jewish people went in, and they have a wall from both sides. Now we come to the next part of the story. And now Egypt and all the troops and everyone, they follow, they pursue the Jewish people. So what do they do? They go into the Yam, which is dry, of course. So now comes the next part of the story. The Jews have passed. The Egyptians went through, went in. Extend your hand once again over the sea, this time to revert the water back to its natural state. Let the water come back on all of the chariots and troops of the Egyptians. That's what happens. Moshe extends his hand over the sea. It's early morning and the sea returns back to its natural strength as the Egyptians were running into it. And they're shaken up, they're overwhelmed by the water. The water returns, it covers the chariots, it covers the troops, it covers the entire army who went into the sea, nobody was left. And then comes the last Pasuk Chavtes. And the Jewish people walked through in dry land in the sea. And the water was a wall from the right side and the left side. And all the commentators point out, this Pasek, first of all, it was said already earlier, and second of all, it's in the wrong place. <laughs> At this point, the Jewish people weren't walking through anymore. At this point, the water has already returned to drown the Egyptians. So first of all, you already said in the beginning, if you take a look, those almost the same words, Pasek Chav Beis, it says, the Jewish people went into the Yam, they went into the Yabash, and the water was a wall. So first of all, why repeat a verse that you said almost verbatim, literally the same thing? Besides, it's out of place. Even if you want to repeat it twice, which itself is not understood, you, you, at this point they're not walking through the sea anymore. They already went through the sea. That's why they didn't drown. If they would be walking now into the sea, it would have been dangerous. And yet after we finish the story, it's like almost, hey, by the way, don't forget the first part of the story. And you have to understand how we're supposed to understand this. <laughs> Ah, ah, very good. Sneak preview. Very well. So if you want to understand this, you have to look for nuanced details. It's not a real, it's a repetition, but it's not a real repetition. Because in the first place, take a look again at Pasuk Chav Beis 22. It says, B'nei chayam bayabasha. In Pasuk Chavtes it says, Uvnei Yisrael holchu bayabasha b'say chayam. What's the difference? But it's an interesting. The first time it says they came into the yam, they went in b'say chayam, they went into the sea, bayabasha. 
but it was dry land because it became dry. The second time it says they went into dry land, which was in the sea. So you say, what's the difference? The bottom line is they're in the same place. But why does the Torah change? In fact, if you look at Hashem's commandment to Moshe Rabbeinu, Pasuk Tazayin, right in the beginning, what does he say? And that's what they did. But the second time around changes the order. Why? It should have said, Any other differences? Even a more subtle one. This is a little harder to catch. The difference between the description and Pasuk Chav Beis and Pasuk Chav Tes. One is the change of order. Did they come into dry land? Did they come into the Yam? But there's another difference. Literally, in the spelling of a word. You see which word? One word is spelled, huh? Chama. With a Vav or without a Vav. They say, who cares? Chaima is Chaima. But it's it. in the Sefer Torah, it's not who cares. Every letter is precise. It's meticulous. Even a regular writer, if you misspell a word, why did you take out the letter? That's why we have spell check. You still got to know English because of people who don't know English. It could be something embarrassing. You know, even with spell check, you can't deal with everything. But why does it say the first time? Which means a wall. Chayma is a wall, a fortress. The second time, without a vav. Without a vav. And of course, our sages, always sensitive to these types of nuances, right away understood there's a message here. The message is, Chaima with a vav can only be pronounced Chaima. Chaima without a vav, remember in a Sefer Torah, there's no Nekudas. You know, we're cheating. We have her from a Chumash, we do Nekudas. But it's really cheating because in a Sefer Torah, there's no Nekudas. There's no vowels. So it doesn't say how to pronounce the word. You just have the letters. Now, we know how to pronounce the words because that's part of the oral tradition. That's why you have to believe. If you don't believe in Teresh Peh, it doesn't make sense because you're giving a text that can't be read. You need to know how to pronounce words. Loi sevashal gdi b'chalev imoy. I could say loi sevashal gdi b'chalav imoy. I mean, I, you could say b'chalev imoy. You could say b'chalev imoy. Don't cook a goat in the fat of its mother, which is also meat. No, it's milk. How do you know it's milk? Because we know how to pronounce the words. But the fact that in the Sefer Torah it's written without nekudas means that when the Torah was given, it was given in a way that it can be pronounced in different ways. That's part of the message. So if you have chayma with a vav, it means a wall. If you have ches mem hey without a vav, chayma, what does chayma mean? Anger. Chayma in Hebrew is ire, wrath. Yeah, that's the fact, chayma. Chayma, ketzef, it's one of the expressions of very profound anger. So they said, v'amayim lahem chayma, the water was angry. Interesting. The water was angry. The first time around, the water wasn't angry. Take a look in the third source. Mechilta. V'yalkot shemayni b'shalach. This is one of the oldest madrasha. Mechilta b'shalach. V'obnei Yisrael halcha b'yabacho b'sayi chayam. V'hoyim alachi ashar estmeim loymar. B'nei adam o'evdi avayda zara ma'alchim b'yabacho b'sayi chayam. Angels were saying, idol worshippers are walking in dry land. U'menayin shafa yam nesmal elem chayma. Even the sea got angry. It says, without a vav, to teach me that the water became a wall and it was angry. Sometimes you can do things, but you're still upset. <laughs> the water did what it had to do, but it was upset. The question is, Rebbein Shalom should have said the first time. The water was so angry, it only realized it got angry before. So the first time it repressed its anger. I know that we have those issues. We sometimes repress. It takes some time till you figure out. You're upset. You don't know. Suddenly you have back pain, you have neck pain, you have stomach pain, you can't sleep. Oh, I'm angry. Okay, got it. That's why you do somatic work to figure out what you're feeling. But we thought the Mayim should be in touch with its emotions. It was, wasn't angry the first time. I got angry later when the story is repeated at the end. Now, as I said, we all know when they came out of the sea, the next thing right after this, the Torah says, Az Yashir Moshe. The Jewish people saw the miracles. They were in awe. They had a Muna. And then Az Yashir Moshe, they start singing. And it's this beautiful song of 44 psukim, 44 verses, where the Jewish people sing. And then, of course, Miriam sings her own song afterwards with the women. And this song we say every single day, Az Yashu and Shir How does the song end? How does the song end? So it ends with the words, Hashem Yimlach La'olam Vat. And then the Torah says, Kivas Sus, it's the next source, Beshalach Tasvav Perikit 
כי וסוס פרוי ברכבוי וברושר ביום, ויושר בשם עליהם אסמי הים ובני ישראל, הולכו ויבושר בסוך הים. Because the, the horses of Pare and all of his chariots and all of his horsemen came into the sea and Hashem brought back on them the water of the sea and the Jewish people walked through the dry land Besoy Chaya. This is how the Shira ends. You see here what's going on? What happened first? The Jewish people went through or the Egyptians were drowned? First the Jews went through and then the Egyptians were drowned. That's what the Torah says. So why here at the end of the Shira they do it in the opposite order? Right, it should have been. And then you also drowned the Egyptians. And here too, what's the order? It's taken from Pasuk Chavtes, not from Pasuk Chavbez. Now I understand why the order was changed, because it's taken from the Pasuk that's t- said after the Egyptians drowned. So you see, it's very meticulous. You see how precise it is. You get what I'm saying here? In the Shira, in the song, they're not quoting the original verse. They're quoting the last verse. And that's why it says, by Abasha and then B'Sai Chayam. And that's why it says it after the story of the Egyptians drowning, just like in the Torah it is. So when they're singing, they're not singing about the first time they went through. They're singing about the going through afterwards. All of this needs a lot of explanation. What is the Torah trying to hint in all of this? Okay, let's change the subject completely. We're going to get back to this Be'ezer Hashem. When Paroi let the Jewish people go, he sent them off. He was desperate. Why was he desperate? Because the males with the firstborn Pcheris, Makas Pcheris, were dying in Egypt. He thought he will die. Every house was struck by tragedy. And thus, he, every house was struck by loss. And thus, he told Paisha Aaron, go, go, go. In the middle of the night, he woke up, leave. And he sent them all out. The next day, they all left with their families and their livestock, etc., As they're leaving, as the Jews are leaving, in Parshas B'Shalach, Hashem tells Moshe, I want, you start to, I want you to go back. I want the Jews to go back and stay there in front of the Yam. So if you take a look at the words of Hashem to Moshe, he says very interesting words. This is B'Shalach, this is your fourth source. B'Shalach, Perik Yud Gimel, Pasuk Yud Zayin, and then Perik Yud Dalet, Pasuk Gimel. It's all the beginning of B'Shalach. Vahi B'Shalach, Pari Esam. Hashem tells Moshe, Amar Pare Livnei Yisrael, Nevuchim Hein Ba'aret Sagar Aleim Amidbar. When Pare is going to see the Jews going backwards, he's going to find out from he, he sent emissaries with them, he sent messengers so to, to monitor the situation. Pare is going to tell the Jews, Nevuchim Hein, they're confused, they're lost. Sagar Aleim Amidbar. The wilderness is closing in on them, meaning they don't know what they're doing. They're quarantined in a desert. They have no Google Maps. They have no GPS. He didn't know that they have GPS, you know, God's, uh, what's GPS? Uh, <coughs> he didn't know about that GPS. Sagar Aleim Amidbar, the desert is closing in on them and they're confused, they're overwhelmed. This is part of the plan and therefore it's going to give him the courage to pursue them and feel that he can bring back these vulnerable slaves to Egypt since they don't know where they're going and they're probably regretting the day they left Egypt because they're out of a civilization. They need to feed their children and they're in a wilderness where you cannot survive for very long. Now the question is, what does Hashem mean when he says Pari is going to tell the Jews they're confused? The Jews left already. So Rashi says it doesn't mean he's going to tell to the Jews, it means he's going to say about the Jews. It doesn't mean literally Li is to. Like, Hashem El you say, yeah, he amra le, whatever. Ya- Yaakov amar le yankel. Yaakov amar le meyer. Le means to. Rashi says here it means about. But the Targum Yoinus and Benuzil, which is literally the earliest, one of the earliest commentaries on the Chumash, come from, from the Tana Yoinus and Benuzil, who still lived in the middle of the second, but towards the end of the second base Hamikdash, as a student of Hillel Hazake. So Yoinus and Benuzil has a translation, and he says, V'yemar, take a look, unbelievable. V'amar pari l'bnei Yisrael means pari will speak to the Jews. And he's going to tell them they're lost. But what do you mean he's going to tell them? He's in Egypt, they're in the desert. How is he going to tell them? Says the Yoinus and Benuzil, V'yemar pari l'dosan v'aviram b'nei Yisrael d'ishtayru b'mitzrayim. There's two Jews who stayed behind. Dosan and aviram. They didn't want to leave. They stayed behind. So pari is going to talk to them. Those are the b'nei Yisrael. Two Jews, Dasan and Aviram, and he's going to tell them, Mitarfin Hinun Amma Beis Yisrael Ba'ara. You know, you guys are brilliant because your stupid nation, your people, 
are just mitarfin. They're lost. They're overwhelmed. They don't know what they're doing. You guys are the only clever Jews. You stayed behind with me. Here you'll have a life. Here you'll have a future. Here you have civilization. Here you have an economy. Here you have homes for your children. You have a good infrastructure. So when it says, Va'amar pare livnei Yisrael, Hashem is actually telling Moshe, Pari is going to speak to Jews. He's going to speak to two Jews. Dasan and Aviram, who stayed behind in Egypt, and he's going to tell them, Nevuchimein baritzagar aleim amidbar. That's basically how the Targum Yonis of Benoziel says this story. Now this is mind-boggling. I understand that sometimes people, regular people, can forget a Pasuk. Okay. But Targum Yonis of Benoziel, you're talking here about one of the greatest Tanoim, one of the greatest sages and teachers in history. Dasan and Aviram stayed back in Egypt? I don't understand. Continue reading Chumash. <laughs> there was a revolt in the desert that was staged by who? By Kairach. And by two fellows, Dasan and Avira. They made this huge machloikas. They, they staged this revolution, this mutiny against Moshe and Aaron. In fact, Moshe summons them because he wants to speak to them, make up with them, talk to them, see what they're saying. And they're going to send a message in Parshas Kairach. And what are they going to say? You took us out of Mitzrayim just to kill us in the desert. Now you're going to rule over us even if you poke out our eyes. They say in Parshas Kairach, we're not going to go up to you. That's how rebellious they were. And at the end, we know the story of Dasan and Aviram and Kairach. When does that happen? That happens in Sefer Bamidbar. That's way after Bishalach. They left Mitzrayim. They crossed the sea. They went to Arsinai. They're now 40 years. In, it's already after the story of the spies. They're 40 years in a desert. And Kairach revolts together with Dasan and Aviram. How? The Targum Yonis and Ozeel forgot Kivayachal, a whole Parsha in Chumash? He forgot the whole Parsha's Kairach? Like, well, well, and Aviram stayed in, they didn't stay in Egypt. You could say, Halavai, they stayed in Egypt. It would have been a lot more peaceful in the desert. Moshe Rabbeinu suffered from these two guys constantly. So it's not like, you know, it's some weird, there's a hint that Dustin Aviram were in the desert. It's a whole parish in Chumash. The whole parish is great. Every child knows Dustin and Aviram staged a mutiny with their families. And they were rebellious. And Moshe tried to talk to them. And even before they were punished, he went to their tents. To, to try to, he went to them to try to speak sense into their hearts, but they wouldn't accept him. They didn't want to say, they, didn't, they weren't interested in him, they were rebellious. And suddenly here, Yonis ibn Azil says, they never left Mitzrayim. They stayed with Parai, and Parai, in fact, told them, You guys are smart. There's no reason to leave. Something is off. How does the target Yonis ibn Azil give such an interpretation? So one has to conclude, <laughs> but before that we come also to another st question. It's not as strong as the first question, because the first question is like, the whole Parsha's Kairach contradicts you. They did not stay in Egypt, sorry. <laughs> Unless Dustin Avirim had a copy of themselves of two people with the same name, but that doesn't make sense, of course. Another question is, there's a very, very famous Medrash, and Rashi brings it, that the purpose of the plague of darkness was that all the Jews who did not want to leave Egypt didn't have to leave Egypt. They died during Makas Chayshech, Bimei Afela, and they didn't leave Egypt. Suddenly you see here, Dasan and Aviram, they didn't leave Egypt. They didn't want to leave. And Pare is talking to them after Yitzhiya Mitzrayim. So that means they were completely intact. It's not as powerful as the first question, because that doesn't say clearly in Chumash. But the first question is, it says clearly that they were in the desert. So obviously they left. So what we have to say is that they were in Egypt, and then when Pare decided to go after the Jewish people, what did they do? <laughs> they went with Pari. <laughs> they went with Pari to pursue the Jewish people. Now, they weren't part of the Jews. They stayed behind. So they went with Pari. But then, something very strange is happening here. Because the sea splits, the Jews are passing. Their intention is to bring back all the foolish Jews back to Mitzrayim, together with them. Remember, their, their supporters, Pari likes them. Pari says, you guys are good. So now we're going to go and get the slaves back. So they're going with Parai now. The sea split, the Jewish people passed, and now what happens? Parai and all the troops, and presumably Dustin and Aviram, went into the Yam. So what should have happened to them? 
I would think they would drown, but suddenly they pop up. <laughs> they pop up in the desert and they're making trouble again and again and again until the climax with Kairach. So there's something very strange here about what does the Targum Yonis and Benazil feel about this whole story when he tells us that they stayed back after Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim. How did they get to the other side? What happened here? Uh, so here we begin to unravel a fascinating subplot in the story that the Torah does not want to explicitly share, and we can understand why, but it does want us to understand it, and it hints to it in every possible way. But in order to gain more perspective, let's remember who Dasan and Aviram were. Dasan and Aviram are the quintessential troublemakers throughout the time of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim. In other words, when there's ever an opportunity, they never lose an opportunity to lose an opportunity, as Abba Ibn said about a certain group. If Moshe Rabbeinu says it's morning, automatically you know they're going to say it's night. If Moshe says the earth is round, the earth is flat. The sun rises from the east, they'll say the sun rises from the west. You can rely on them. Moshe says right, they say left. It's almost instinctive. How do I know this? Because literally every story, they're somehow at the forefront of trouble. And it begins way, way early. on. Moshe Rabbeinu's first debut, <laughs> you know, he... he doesn't have even become like his quintessential rivals because the first time he shows up, they're there. And they don't leave until a long, long time later. Moshe Rabbeinu goes out. He sees an Egyptian beating a Jew. He kills the Egyptian. He saves the Jew. The second day he goes out and he sees two Hebrews quarreling with each other. He tells one, And the one guy says, Oh, you're going to inform on me? You're going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And Moshe says, Oh, no, they know the story. And indeed, Parai is told about the story. Say Chazal, who are these two Hebrews fighting? Shnei Anoshim Ivrim Nitzim. So through the Gzeir Shavas, through their method of interpretation, they say, of course, it was Dosan and Aviram. So Dosan and Aviram were the first ones right away to react to Moshe. Moshe said, why are you beating your friend? And he says, oh, you're going to kill me too? And somebody told Pare about it. And it came from one of them. How exactly it was told, the Torah doesn't say, by you, God. But Pare found out the story, and Moshe had to run away. So he already understood that he's dealing with people who are not simple. They're certainly not going to be very friendly to them. In fact, later, Hashem says you can go back to Egypt because those who wanted to kill you are gone. So Chazal say, who are these Anashim? The same Anashim did. But they didn't die. They say they became poor. And Ani Chashav Kameis. So much did Chazal feel it was Dasan and Avirim that they're ready to change the meaning of death to poverty. So you can go back to Egypt. So if we see, take a look in the next source, Shmois Perig Beis, Pasi Kedil, right in the beginning, says Rashi, Anashim Ivrim. Who are these Shnei Anashim Ivrim? Dasan Avirim Heim. How do I know? Hesirum and Aman, we're going to see them later. In Parshas B'Shalach this week. They part the sea, they go on the other side, they're saved, they need food. The manna comes down from heaven. Moshe Rabbeinu says, every day take the portions you need and eat it. Don't leave over for the next day. The next day you'll have your own food. But of course, there's two people who will not listen to him. And they leave over the man and it becomes, it becomes uh, wormy. Worms enter into it and it decomposes. It becomes moldy rotten. Gets filled and fested with worms and it smells and Moshe is upset at them. Who are these two people? Rashi says, Dasan and Avira. <laughs> you have man. The man is coming down tomorrow. It's not coming down tomorrow. You better make a savings account and put the food in the pantry because you're not going to have food tomorrow. So you would think, okay, we're done. It's enough stories. Next, Parsha Shlach. The Miraglam come back and dissuade the Jews from entering into the land. Let's go back to Egypt. One man told his brother, let's go back. Who told us to his brother? Says Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, Dasan Vavira. All the Jews said, let's go back. But there was specifically two people. One told his brother or his friend, let's go back to Egypt. Now we understand that. They really liked Egypt. These guys liked They never wanted to leave. This whole plan seemed strange to them. They didn't believe a word Moshe said. They didn't believe not in God, not in Moshe. Everybody says, not So already in Egypt they were fighting and fighting Moshe Rabbeinu. They thought the entire plan to rebel against Pari is ridiculous and absurd. doesn't make sense. 
Obviously, it doesn't seem like they had any belief in a creator and certainly Moshe Rabbeinu as his messenger. So even when it comes to the man, what, they're, they're, not, they're going to put away food. <laughs> they don't want to be hungry the next day. The Miraglim say we can't go into the land of Israel. Yeah, we all know this all the while and we should go back to Egypt. That was our plan. You know, they're very consistent, these guys. It's one thing you could say about them. They're very, very consistent. And then the climax is in Parshas Kairach. In Kairach, the next source, Moshe tries to call them and speak to them. They say, Loi Nala, we're not going up. You took us out of Egypt to kill us in the desert. Here again, they go back to the same theme. You have based an entire, you have based an entire faith. You created an entire nation based on a mythical idea that is impractical, not attainable, not feasible. You are destroying us. You didn't bring us to the land of milk and honey. You didn't give us a field. You didn't give us a vineyard. We will not go up even if you poke at our eyes. Which only brings us to a major, major question. And that is, so what's happening here? If they are these people, every time there's trouble, when they're fighting right in the beginning, it's them. With the man... The mana, it's them. With the miraglim, it's them. With kairach, it's them. Wow, they really have a resume, these guys. There's nobody who fought Moshe like Dasan and Avira. And yet, they did not die during the darkness. They somehow made it through the Yamsuf, even when everybody drowned. They came out to the other side. What is happening here? Who is this Dasan and Avira? What's going on here? And here, we come across an extraordinary insight. Really, just, I would say, mind-boggling. And I saw the insight first in a sefer called Chidushe Ma'aril Diskin al You may have heard Rabbi Yeshua, of Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. Even if you haven't heard from him, I assume that probably the first 30 years of your life, every month you got an envelope in your home from Beis HaYisoyimim Diskin. You know what I mean? Beis HaYisoyimim Diskin. Right, the Diskin Orphanage Center was created by him in the 1880s. Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin was one of the great, great Lithuanian and Russian rabbis and sages and leaders in the 19th century. They called him the Saraf of Brisk, the, the, the fireball of, of, of Brisk. Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin, he's known as Maharil Diskin because his name was Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua Yehuda Leib, Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. He was a great, great Gone, a sage, a very big rav and a leader. And he served as rabbi in Lomja, in Mizrich, which is Ukraine, in Kovna, Lithuania, in Shklov, Belarus, and in Brisk, which is Lithuania. And then he escaped Brisk and he went to Yerushalayim. The reason he escaped is it's not for this year, but very briefly, there was a couple and uh, it was time for the couple to separate and for the woman to get a get. I'm saying this story for a specific reason. You'll figure out why. And uh, the husband refused to give a get. So she was an aguna and he made a condition that she has to give him an enormous amount of money in order to pay him off to get the get. And the money has to be deposited by Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin, the Rav, so the money will be by him in escrow. And after he guarantees that the money is there, he will give her the get. And she had no choice, so she put together the money with the help of you know, people who cared. And the rabbi got the money, and he gave her a get. The Rebetzin, this is why you need good Rebetzins, took the money and gave it back to the woman. <laughs> she took the money, she said, this is, this is scandalous, this is ridiculous. She took the money <laughs> and she gave it back to the woman. He found out, the, the, the husband, the ex-husband, he informed to the authorities that Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin is a rebel and you can't trust him and he's a thief and he's a thug. And he was imprisoned. He was imprisoned. The court found him innocent because they heard about what happened, but then started a whole messira against him by his enemies and he had to sneak out and he ended up in Eretz Yisrael and he became the leading Paisik for the Ashkenazim in Yerushalayim until he passed away, Chanukah Tafresh Nun Ches, which is 1898. In fact, they offered him in the 1880s to become the rabbi of America. <laughs> he refused, which was probably smart, and he remained in Yerushalayim, where he passed away 18 
1898, the end of the 19th century. He was born 1818. I say this to you because the insight he's going to say here, Rabbi Yeshua Leib is what you could call a Litvak Sheba Litvak, meaning he was a quintessential Lithuanian sage. So the Torah he's going to say, you know, some people would call real Hasidish Torah, so to speak. Extremely warm and human, very uh, sensitive and empathetic. But it shows you how Torah thinks. And that's why the fact that Yeshua Leib Diskin says this for more people. He was a rigorous, rigorous, rigorous mind. A real halachic uh, personality to the, in a very, very powerful way. He was known as a Kanoi in Yerushalayim. True, rigorous, zealous, zealous in his Yerushalayim. So the fact that he gives this interpretation shows you how a Torah mind thinks about things and what it sees in Torah. And on the contrary, those who are greater zealots for Yerushalayim, how they feel when it comes to empathy for another person. What does Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin say? He says, there's one more story about Dasan and Avira. We spoke about all the horrible things they did, but there's one more story about Dasan and Avira. What's the other story? And this is actually the first story before all the other stories, before the stories with Moshe, after the story of hitting, but before the other stories, at the end of Shmois, there's another story about Dasan and Avira. What happens there? Parai, after Moshe came to him and asked him to send the Jewish people out, he said, they're a bunch of lazy people. You have time to think about freedom. You're not working hard enough. So what does Parai do? He increases the quota of labor. Till then, the Jews were given straw so that they were making bricks. When you make bricks, you take mud. You take, of course, earth, water, mud, and you mold them, and you bake them either in the sun or in a furnace. That's how they would make bricks. But in order to make them solid, you need to put straw into the bricks. Where are you going to get straw? So the Egyptians gave the slaves straw, and they had to produce every day a quota of bricks. Pare said, that's over. You go and find your own straw and collect the straw, but the quota of bricks has to remain the same. Maskoines halavenim, the end, the cheshben, the quota of the bricks to say. The Jewish people couldn't do it. Already under the circumstances, they were slave laborers. They were oppressed. They couldn't catch their breath. They didn't have a day and a night. That's why the women had to work so hard with the mirrors, Chazal say, in order to be able to create families. It was impossible. The last thing exhausted slaves want to do at night is spend time with somebody. They just if you have an hour to rest, it's like the Jews in the camps. <laughs> they were starving. They were hunted down. They were beaten. They were killed. It was horrible, horrible. So understand what it took from the women to be able to continue some type of family life. And that's why they donated the mirrors to the Mishkan. And Moshe Rabbeinu felt sepasnished to make mirrors, to use mirrors that women used in their bedrooms. That this is going to be the main thing in the Mishkan for the Kiyar. Moshe Rabbeinu said sepasnished. And what did Hashem say? You know the Rashi in Vayakal. Elu chavivin alaymen akal. This is the best contribution for the Mishkan. All the other contributions are nice. But these mirrors were responsible for the future of the Jewish people. Without these mirrors, there would be no Jewish children left. So have respect, Moshe Rabbeinu, for these mirrors. It was an interesting debate between Moshe and the Rabbeinu Shalom Kivayach. So what happened? So the Torah says that they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Now the way it was, you know, just like the, the Nazis did this also, they appointed Jews to govern the Jews in the camps. Pari did the same thing. His commanders appointed Jewish policemen so they would be in charge on the Jews. So if something didn't happen, the police were blamed. So the Torah says at the end of Shmois that the Jewish policemen could not demand this from the Jews. It was too much. So what happened? They were beaten by Pari's officers and commanders because they didn't force their brothers to produce the right quota because they couldn't. They saw how torturous it was, how simply impossible it was. And what happened was they went to Parai and they said, we're trying to be loyal citizens. We're trying. But this is causing us to betray you because we simply don't have the energy. And that's when Parai said, Nirpim atem nirpim, you're a bunch of lazy people. You're lazy people. And that's why you're saying, oh, we can't work. We can't work because you're lazy. Tichbat, make it harder. You're going to produce the same amount and you will be beaten if not. Who do the policemen blame for all of this? The ones who instigated it. Who instigated it? Who made Pare angry? 
Moshe Rabbeinu. If Moshe and Aaron wouldn't have come to Parah and say, let's go free, Parah would say, oh, they're not thinking about freedom. Because Moshe and Aaron went to Parah, and therefore they told him, God says, Hashem says, let my people go. Parah got furious. Oh, we have this whole new revolution simmering in the Jewish psyche. No good. They're not working hard enough. So from the policeman's perspective, what were they looking at? They didn't know about who Moshe Rabbeinu really is, what his message was. They're living in a climate, they're living in a perspective that this is it. Parai is the boss. There's no way out. So either we're going to live with Parai or we're going to die on the Parai. Who's making the trouble? Moshe. So when Moshe comes out of Parai, what do they do? They tell him, God is going to punish you. You are the ones who are responsible for our genocide. We will all die because of you. You see who they're blaming? This is what happens to tortured slaves. Moshe Rabbeinu is trying to liberate them. But in their minds, he's the enemy. Pare is not the enemy. Pare is reality. <laughs> you could call him the enemy, but he's reality. Moshe is disturbing. Moshe is getting Pare angry. If we can only please Pare, if we could calm down Pare, we have survived. We'll continue to survive miserably, but we will survive. Who were these policemen who were beaten? Who were these policemen who screamed at Moshe? Who were the policemen who went to Parai and say, don't do this? So Rashi tells us, take a look in the next source. The second to the last source on the first page. The policemen were beaten. Why were they beaten? Because you did not get the quota of bricks. The next passage, so they screamed to Parai. Lama sase kai, why are you doing this to your servants? The chatas amecha, you're causing us to sin against you. So Pari says, you're a bunch of lazy people. And in Chpasik Chaf, they meet Moshe and Aaron standing when they came out of Parai. And Chaf Alev, Ayomru Aleim, Yeira Hashem Aleichem, Vishpoit Hashem, Vashtem Esrechenu, Bene Fari, Vene Avadav, Lasas Cherub, Beyadam Largeno. God should see what you do and He will judge us. He will judge you because you have made. Interesting words. You have made our smell, our odor, stink. You made us. Uh, you made our odor so putrid, putrid. We smell so bad in the eyes of Pari and the eyes of his servant. And this is going to give him an excuse to take a sword and kill us. And it's your fault, says Rashi. And who are these people? Darshu Kol Nitzim Vinitzavim Dasan Vaviram Hayo. It's Dasan and Aviram. And the Medrash says they were the policemen. They were beaten. They went to Parai. They got so upset at Moshe Rabbeinu. They didn't believe in Gula. They didn't believe Hashem spoke to Moshe. They didn't believe in the promise of redemption. Comes Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin and he says, once you understand this story, everything is different. Dosan and Aviram did not believe. Dosan and Aviram were what we call Kaifrim, Apikarsim, and Rishayim. They didn't believe Hashem. They didn't believe in Moshe. In fact, they rebelled at every possible moment because they simply did not accept this whole story. They thought Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was a joke. They, they, they Pasha did not have that sensitivity. Their antennas were not tuned into that, and therefore they were such troublemakers. But Rabbi Shur Leib Diskin says, he said, we have to understand one thing about them. And that is, they actually cared about their brothers. They were ready to be beaten for the slaves. They went to Pare to scream, even though they knew it's dangerous to go into a Hitler and try to speak sense into his mind. And they were not ready to demand it from the Jews, let the Jews suffer, because they cared. He said there were Jews in Mitzrayim who lived in their ivory towers. They didn't care. Dasan and Aviram wept for their brothers. They didn't believe. They didn't have a spiritual connection. They didn't believe in Moshe. They didn't believe in Hashem. But what? They had a heart. They had empathy. And they were ready to be physically beaten. And they were for their brothers. So let's see Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. The next, if you turn over your source sheet, what he says. They sacrificed their life and were whipped. Why? To ease the burden from the Jews. When they told Moshe, you made us smell, they meant physically. 
when they were beaten by the Egyptians, it was in a way that their odor became horrible from, this, from the whips. So they push it smelled. That's what they meant. He says there were other policemen who were beaten. And later, when Hashem says to Moshe, choose 70 people and they will have divine inspiration together with you, who does he choose? The policemen from Egypt. He says, but Dasan and Avirim, he couldn't choose for that. That's a parsha's Balaiz. You know why? To have Ruach HaKodesh, you have to believe that there's a higher source. They didn't. He says, but something else happened. They would not die in the plague of darkness. Don't compare them to other Jews. Why? Because they cared about their brothers. They were misguided. They made terrible mistakes. They didn't believe. They're called Rishayim. But one thing he says, understand that they sacrificed themselves to try to help their brothers physically, not just mentally, not well with words. And he says, Don't compare them to other Jews. There were other Jews that became best friends with the Egyptians. They assimilated completely. They became best friends. They became wealthy. They became respected. They didn't want to leave. They had a nice, 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 relatively, they had a nice place there. They died. Why? They did not participate in the pain of the Jewish people. They said, it's none of our business. Go deal with your own problems. They weren't part of the labor of the slave labor. They didn't even want to leave Dosan and Aviram. But don't compare them to them. They didn't want to leave because in their mind, this was a colossal mistake that would cause the death of all the millions of Jews that left. With 600,000 males between 20 and 60, plus you have females, same amount, so it's 1.2 million, plus you have children, plus you have senior citizens, so you're digging about 2, 3 million Jews, or whatever the right number is, but a huge amount of numbers, they're all going to die, it's going to be the beginning and the end of the Jewish people. If we stay in Mitzrayim, at least there'll be two Jews alive, Dust and Avira, maybe we'll have kids and grandkids, and there'll be some continuity to the Jewish people. Says Rabbi Shua Leib Diskin, don't compare them to others. But wait, we still have a question. How did they get over to the other side? So now take a look. Be'er Mayim Chaim. Be'er Mayim Chaim is Reb Chaim Chernovitzer. On Beshalach, he goes to that. You remember we spoke about, now come back to the original story of Kriyas Yamsov. And you'll see here how there's a story within a story. If you go back to our first source sheet, okay? Our first, I mean, our first source in the source sheet. You remember? Hashem tells Moshe, Put your, extend your hand over the sea, split the sea. Let the Jews go in by Abasha. Let them go in into the sea, it's going to become dry land. That's exactly what they do. Pasuk Chavbeis, they go in by Abasha, the water is at Chaima. What happens next? The Egyptians are chasing them, they're going into the sea. Hashem says, Time to bring back the water. Moshe strikes the sea, and what happened? Moshe extends his hand over the sea, the water comes back. One second. Who was in that water now? Dawson and Aviram. <laughs> they were with Parai, so they were in the water. But one second. But they were fighting against Moshe in the desert. They're leaving over the man. They're telling the spa, they're telling their brothers, let's go back to Mitzrayim. They're fighting with Kairach. So they're in the midbar. So they went through the Yamsuf. So there's something off here. So Targum Yenis and Benuzil, what he as I said, he forgot a whole part. It doesn't make sense. So the Torah says, Well, wait. The Egyptians drowned, but I forgot to tell you one more detail. There's one more detail. What's the detail? Now look at Pasuk Chavtes. Uvnei Yisrael halchu vayabasha b'saychayam. After the Egyptians are drowning, the water is back. Bnei Yisrael halchu vayabasha b'saychayam. Now, this is a little bit of a far stretch. So now take a look. You're second to the last source. Turn over the page. Be'er Mayim Chayim. Take a look. Miyut Rabim Shnayim. In Hebrew, 
plural is minimum two. Can be one, minimum two. So when it says uvnei Yisrael, it could be a hundred, it could be a million, it can also be two. Two people are bnei Yisrael. When you say the sons of Yisrael, it could be three, it could be two, it could be ten. Loimar ki al shnayim mi Yisrael bilvad nikra hayam. There was a kriyas yamsa for two Jews. Who? Vehem dasan vaviram. Sha'amru chazal she nisharu ve nikra lem hayam lovad. Chazal say, Targaryen Simazil says, they stayed behind. And yet they were in the desert. They had a Kriyas Yamsuf. Chidushim my real disk in Saif Parsha Shmois. Shamati b'shem Admurzal. She'isa b'medrish she'ayam nikra lefneihem. These two policemen who were beaten, Dosan and Aviram, they had a Kriyas Yamsuf. Now you see the difference between b'shem chayam b'yabasha, b'yabasha b'shem chayam. You see how the Torah alludes to this? The first Jews, when they went in, what were they going into? They were going into a sea. <laughs> when they got into the sea, what happens? It's dry. So it says, But let's talk about the last Jews. Dosan and Avirim. What were they going into? They weren't going into a sea. What were they going into? Dry land. If there would have been a sea, <laughs> Pari wasn't stupid. He didn't want to drown. If there would have been a sea, nobody would go in there. The only reason they went in is because it was by Abosha. <laughs> So that's why the order changes. Of Nei Yisrael Halchu by Abosha b'Say Chayam. Ah, ah. Now I understand why now the water got angry. The first time around, why should the water be angry? We're saving these people, but now the water is saying, "O M G, these guys! I'm ready to split. I'm ready to split, but these guys? It's not so poshut." I understand. Okay, I'll do it. You're the boss, God. You know, I, I work for you. I don't make my own policies in this world. But we understand. I would also be angry. Let's face it. They came to the other side and they continue to make trouble. You would think after such a Kriyas Yamsuf, they would say, mm, maybe Moshe is right. <laughs> it shows you who doesn't an Avira more. Even that, they probably blamed. There was some tide. I don't know what the moon did last night. Uh, it's interesting to find out. We have to do some more scientific research to figure out this mazel that the Jews have, that the sea splits exactly when they come. I don't know. However, they rationalized it, but of course the water was angry. Now when we say the shira, when we sing, and we thank Hashem, how do we finish it? We thank for the main Kriyas Yamsev, but then we add that last piece. Hashem yimlech loy lamad ki vasus pari b'rich b'rash 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 we're grateful for the fact to see how Hashem looks at a Jew who's ready to be beaten for another Jew. A Jew whose heart feels the pain of another Jew. Even heretical, a heretical Jew. Even a very misguided Jew. Even a quintessential troublemaker. An apikairis, as you would say. A kaifer l'chal Because they were by Matan Torah. It's not like they weren't by Matan Torah. They weren't tinoik, some tinoikas shenishbu. And that's why at the end they were punished harsh, very harshly. And yet, there's a special gratitude. Wow. This is the power of empathy. This is the power of attachment. This is the power of love. This is the power of caring for who? For two people, Dasan and Avira. This is Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskins, the Briskerov's teaching on these two Chevre, Dasan and Avira. You want to ask something? I saw you raised. You want to ask something? Somebody? Okay. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach, of blessed memory, was one of the great halachic authorities in the last generation. He lived in Yerushalayim, in Shari Chesed, Rosh Hashiv of Kal He was a very, very known uh, leader and sage, and a very special person. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach was also in Yerushalayim. And he once shared a story, a very powerful story, there was one of the great rabbis in Galicia, was known as the Baruch Tam, Rabbi Baruch Frankel to Umim. Rabbi Baruch Frankel to Umim. He has a Sefer Shal Satshuvah's Baruch Tam. Uh, he passed away in 1828, a few, a few decades before Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. He lived in Galicia, he lived in Moravia, he was very, very well known, Rabbi Baruch Frankel to Umim. And he and his wife once arranged a marriage for their son to the daughter of a very, very respectable, wealthy, affluent, and wonderful family in Galicia. Galicia is eastern Poland. And it seemed very, very promising. 
So the two families, as it was the custom then, the parents of the Hassan and the parents of the Kala, the future Hassan and Kala, met to discuss you know, their children and to discuss arrangements and to discuss details and just to discuss the very, the very issue. The Baruch Tam, Zaman Ayabach said, the Baruch Tam came to the meeting and the Mechotanista, or the future Mechotanista, which means the mother of the Kala, sees him and she says, you seem very distressed. And it wasn't a good, oh, it wasn't, uh, it didn't, it wasn't good news for her because you're meeting the potential parents of your future daughter-in-law. It's an exciting time, right? You're getting to marry, to, to, to bring your son into a good shidduch. So why, so she saw he was just distressed. So she said, what's, what's bothering you? Is something, are you unhappy about the shidduch? He says, no, no, no. What's bothering me is, in town by us, the water carrier, the Vasetreger, is very sick. He's sick. Now you have to understand what a water carrier meant in that day, right? We don't understand what it means because we have sinks. But this is before the Industrial Revolution, or certainly the first years of the Industrial Revolution. So there's no sink. So the water carrier was responsible to go to the river or to go to the well and schlep water to homes, and people would pay him. You could understand the type of back-breaking labor it was, quite literally, from morning to night. And what did he already make for a bucket of water? And he literally slept from house to house. Obviously, poor people would go themselves. But people who couldn't afford it would pay the water carrier. And it was considered a very, very difficult form of work, both physically and mentally and emotionally. You had to be strong. You had to have stamina. And you literally schlepped things on your back all day as much as you can. And you did it from sunrise till sunset in order to be able to support your family. And uh, Baruch Tam was the Rav of the city and he heard that this water carrier is sick. And, uh, and, uh, she, and, and he says that uh, I just, I'm, I'm very distressed about, about his illness. And especially, hopefully if the, all this gets concluded, we might make a simcha, you know, a tenayim, whatever we'll make, or they'll make the wedding soon. And I really want him to be there. And he may not be able to be there, so I'm also very upset about that. I think it would give him chizuk, and it would, it would be an honor for us. And I'm just very upset about him, and how his family is suffering, and so forth. So, Reb Shleim Zalman Oyebach told a story that she told the Baruch Tam. I just want to quote him. She said, is he your family? He said, no. She says, I don't understand. Why are you letting his sickness spoil our simcha? He's a water carrier. He's not related to you. He's just a simple man. Why are you allowing him to ruin your mood at this important meeting? Sri Shlom Zalman Ayabach said that the Baruch Tam called out his wife and he said, this shidduch is not for us. <laughs> this shidduch is not for us. And he canceled the shidduch. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. You know, he was very polite, he was very respectful. And he said, it's not for us. She didn't hear the conversation, his wife didn't hear the conversation. So she asked him why, what happened. She trusted him. So he said, if one is not bothered by the fact that another Jew is hurting, I don't care how successful, affluent, how much money they have, this lack of sensitivity, it's really not what our son needs. It's not for us. It's not how you want to hear somebody speak. And that was it. And he canceled the Shidduch. Reminds me, there was a Jew, you may have heard from him. His name was Reb Moshe Lov Bayan. Reb Moshe Lov Bayan. He was a great grandson of the Heleke Rizhina, Reb Yisrael of Rizhin. And he escaped. He was from Krakow. Um, he was from the Rizhin Bayan dynasty, Reb Moshe Lov Bayan. He was born in Krakow, I think. And he was one of the great leaders in Poland. During the First World War, he escaped to Vienna. Reb Moshe of Bayan was killed in Auschwitz in 1943. They called him Reb Moshe of Bayan. He was a very special and holy Jew. In the community where he lived, there was a, a few, there was a Jew who wanted to bring him down. This Jew was a masculine, was very he didn't like Reb Moshe of Bayan. He wanted to bring him down. He felt that he's a danger because he was such a powerful voice for Yiddishkeit. So what do you do? He sent somebody to go ask Reb Moishala, what should he do? He has a son who's being drafted to the army. And he knew 
the Jews had a system <laughs> where there were different methods to get Bachrim out of the army. You're talking here Russia, you're talking Poland, you're talking Vienna, because it was very dangerous. So there were different methods. But if anybody found out, this is treason. So he had this fellow go to him, but really he was a Musser. So he was expecting Reb Moshe to give him some, you know, crooked idea using the underground methods, and this would be a tremendous way to get him arrested or certainly expelled from the city. So this Jew came to Reb Moshe, and he starts crying, and he says, Rebbe, I have an only son. He was only born when... It was Nishkishtoigen, Nishkishtoigen. He was only born when we were older, and now he's being drafted to the army, and so many soldiers are dying, and he's, he's going to die. So Reb Moshe listened and thought, and he said, no, all I can do is daven for you. Let me daven. Let's say Tehillim. So he starts crying even more. Rebbe, come on. There's nothing else you can do. You're so connected. You have so much power. Like, come on. Somebody we can bribe. Somebody we can... Do. He said, all I can do is daven. Now the guy breaks down completely, sobbing. Please, please, how can you just... He said, I'm not ignoring, but all I can do is a daven. And that was it. The poor guy went away very disappointed. So one of his uh, Talmidim or Hasidim who was there says, Rebbe, I don't understand. Such a lack of empathy. Like, you seem so indifferent. Like, okay, we'll dive in. Like, and, and we know that there's different methods. Like, the Marshallah said, that's what I felt. Later they found out <laughs> that this was all a setup. So this guy came and said, wow, you're a novi, you're a miracle worker, in Ruach HaKadosh. He says, nothing to do with Ruach HaKadosh. Nothing to do. So how did you know you didn't say a word? You just said, let's daven. Nobody can arrest you for that. He said, I'll tell you how I know. <laughs> it had nothing to do with prophecy. He says, they say about my Zayd, the derisioner, that he could feel the pain of a Jew anywhere in the world and experience it. He said, I'm not on that level. I can't feel the pain of anybody in the world. But one thing, if somebody's near me, and telling me a story about their life and their heartbroken, I can feel their pain. And here I felt nothing. I felt nothing. That instinct I can trust. <laughs> that instinct, I felt nothing. So I knew there's nothing to say. I'll just say, let's daven. We could daven. We could daven for him. We could daven for him to stop lying. We could daven for his child if he has a child. We could daven for whatever we daven for. Now here you see something. Dosen and Aviram were not Tinoikus Shanishbu. They were not 19-year-old kids who grew up without an education. Dosen and Aviram fought Moshe at every step of the way. They were real Rishayim, willingly. They were swallowed up at the end by the earth. You could see who they were. Still, as Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin says, their heart ached for their brothers and sisters. And they were ready to take a clap for it. Not to die. They weren't killed. They were beaten. And because of that, not only did they not buy by Makas Choshech, they had a special Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and a special Kriyas Yamsov. And they had a special dignity that the Creator of the world gave them even if the sea was screaming and angry. Why? Because they cared. They felt. They had empathy. They were attached. They put their lives on the line. They were part of the work. They engaged in the slave labor and they tried to protect their brothers to the best of their understanding with the tools they had, even confronting Pare himself. What does this teach us today about our relationship to our brothers and sisters who put their lives on the line to protect their people? Recently, there were a few people, they probably did not contemplate what they were saying before they said it. But using the Torah, using Yiddishkeit, said words that you see how detached from the entire Weltanschauung of Yiddishkeit it is. Even when you're dealing with a Dosen and Aviram, there is still an awe and a gratitude for the Avas Yisrael that they had. Kol Shekane, a billion, 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 endless times more. When you're talking about young boys, young fathers, from all different types of demographics, and many of them indeed grew up without Yiddishkeit, without Torah, without mitzvahs. They sacrificed their lives, they're burying their friends, 
fathers who watch their children dying, a new generation of orphans growing up in the land of Israel. And most of them do it with such a passion and such a glee to be able to know that they're defending their brothers and sisters, millions of Jews who would be wiped out by Hamas and our enemies. One, wolf surrounded, one lamb surrounded by 70 wolves. The natural feeling of a Jew who's in touch with any basic menschlichkeit and Yiddishkeit is so much love and gratitude and authentic connection. These are not just our brothers. These are not just our sisters. These are the holiest of the holies, heroes of heroes. Doesn't mean everything is perfect and it doesn't mean there's no mistakes and doesn't mean people can't become better. But a demonstration of indifference and apathy in the name of Yiddishkeit. Mishama Kazais be Israel, who heard such a thing? It says in Zaya that even Avram Avinu did not do the right thing. And he's not blamed, he was before Matan Torah. It says Avram Avinu, the Zoya says, not I, the Zoya says Avram didn't do the right thing. Why? Because when he davened to Hashem for Zdoim, he davened that the Zdoim should be saved because of the Tzaddikim living in Zdoim. If not for that, they should be destroyed. Even Avram did not, he didn't do the right thing because he was before Matan Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, he did the right thing. He told Hashem, either you forgive them, and if not, erase me from the Sefer Torah you have written. I don't want to be a part of the Sefer Torah if you're not going to forgive them. Forgive those who were partially or, or at some point culprits and responsible. If not, they don't need forgiveness. He didn't only pray for the Tzaddik and Moshe Rabbeinu, who were completely detached. The Jews who didn't protest, or the Jews who somehow were part of it, the Zoya says, finally Moshe did this. And this is even Rishayim who were involved in the Chet Egel. But it shows you the approach of how Yiddishkeit looked at it. <laughs> the Mishnah says in Sanhedrin that a Russia who got the death penalty, and you know why he got the death penalty? Not for missing Mayim Achroinim. Mayim Achroinim is a big thing. And not even for not washing before I might see the first time eating with aluminum foil. He got the death penalty. It was very hard to get the death penalty. It could be murder of a desire, serious, serious stuff. So the Mishnah says, when he, this person gets the death penalty, Shechina Ma'ay Maris, what does the Shechina say? Kalani Meiroshi, Kalani Mizrahi. I'm having a migraine headache and my arm is hurting because every Jew is an aver, is a limb of the Shechina. Hashem says, Kalani Meiroshi, my, my, my head feels so in pain. The Shechina, the divine presence, is grieving who? Somebody who got a death penalty because of an intentional crime with witnesses and warning. It was almost impossible to get a death penalty in Judaism. Rabbi Akiva once said, if I would have been in Sanhedrin, no Jew would have ever been killed. Because <laughs> it was so hard. Others say, once in 70 years, Sanhedrin are called chablon and terrorists for killing somebody. It was almost impossible to get. You have to have witnesses, and you have to be warned before, and you have to tell them that you understand the warning, you have to repeat the warning, and then do it within a few seconds. It was mamish impossible. And if you mamish tried to because you were crazy, then you anyway weren't killed because you were crazy. And still this, so you understand what a Rosh Merusha you have to be, mamish to go against everything. And still the Shechina is busy sobbing. Kalani Merusha, Kalani Mizrahi. It's not a contradiction. Kosher came to come with him. When you're talking about Kedoshim of Kedoshim people, that their hearts are so filled with Avas Yisrael, with Achtas Yisrael, they want to do whatever they can to help their brothers and sisters. And they put their lives in their line. I saw a, a commander being interviewed. His name is Oded Harush. And he was telling the reporter, who was interviewing him, he says, I want to tell you what happened last week in Khan Yunus. We were about to go into a home. So I turned to my unit and I said, I'm going to go first. So one of the soldiers under me said, no, 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 I'm going to go first. I said, why? He says, you're a father of four children, so I want to go first. I looked at him and I said, and you're a father of two children. And you're young, you didn't build your home yet. You need to go back to build your home. I'm already a little older. And he said, they got into a dispute. And I told him, I'm going because I also have experience in Gaza and I went first. He says, I w wish I could transplant an entire Jewish people for a few hours to Khan Yunus to watch how the soldiers communicate with each other. 
to watch a level of dedication and sacrifice that is it's beyond seichel, it's beyond nature. It's not somebody's, you can't force this thing on somebody. They're in touch with frequencies of the soul, what we call Yechidah Sheba Nefesh, the core of the Jewish soul, where they literally experience their divine connection with themselves and their friends and the entire Klai Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael and all of history. It's like almost you could see, the sh- not almost, you see Gili Elikus, you see divinity manifested on their faces and their emotions. It's something that's deeper than life even, deeper than physical life. He says, I wish all the Jews can see the energy of these people. He says, then before you would make your post and write your article and make your comment, think twice before you're writing what you're writing. One of our dear participants... Oh, you're going to have to open it, I think. It may have died, okay. <laughs> no worries, no worries. No worries. Wow. I didn't know why. I want to share something with you. I saw this in an article by uh, Sivan Rahav Meir in Israel. She spoke to Nathan Sharansky. Sharansky, as you know, was a refusenik, a Soviet Jew, who tried to get to Israel. They wouldn't let him out. And ultimately he was imprisoned with accusations of espionage and rebellion against the Soviet regime. Later he was liberated, he came to Eretz Yisrael, he's living today in Israel, he was in the Knesset, he was, uh, he was the chairman of the Jewish agency, the Sachnut. Avi Natan Or is one of the hostages who was taken by Hamas, Yemach Shemam and Simchas Torah, Tavshin Peidal, on October 7th, 2023. Yaron Or is his father. Avi Natan's father. Avi Natan is the hostage and Yaron is his father. So the father was speaking about his son, Avinatan. And the father said that recently, all he's thinking about all day and all night is his son who's in captivity in Hamas. And he's thinking about Nathan Sharansky, who was in prison for years and years and years and tortured and in solitary confinement by the Soviets, but he made it out with his resilience and resolve. And it gives him strength to, to remember Sharansky's story. So Nathan Sharansky called up the father just to give him a little more chizuk, you know, directly. He calls up the father Yaron, the father of Avinatan. And Sharansky said to Sivan, he said, I want to tell you what I told the father. He said, I was in prison. And in prison for many years by the Soviets, no paradise. I want to tell you that many things gave me strength. First of all, my wife Avital, Avital Sharansky, although we never met, they would not allow a meeting. But just the fact that I knew about her, I felt her, and it gave me strength. The second thing was the Jewish people gave me strength. I knew that people are praying for me. I knew that there's an amazing people that I'm connected to. They're thinking about me, and their strength gave me strength. Sharansky also said I had a Tehillim. I don't know if you know this, but they took away his Tehillim, and he went on a hunger strike until they gave it back to him. Now, he didn't know Hebrew. <laughs> Sharansky grew up in the Soviet Union. There was no chedesh. No, you didn't learn Hebrew there. But in prison, he learned, taught himself. So it was the only thing he had. So he taught himself how to read Tehillim. And he said, the kapitlach of those. So you're talking about a secular Soviet Jew who grew up without Yiddishkeit. He taught himself how to read Tehillim and I gave him energy. He had Tehillim for nine years. I felt that the psukim, the verses that David HaMelech wrote, are about me and they give me energy. I wrote that David HaMelech was writing about me, my difficulties, my adversity and my mitzukah, my anguish, my suffering. And then Sharansky said, I told, Avin, I told Avinatan's father, Yaron, I said, after many years in prison, I realized that there's actually something deeper that's giving me strength. It took me years to figure this out. 
He says, it's not just David HaMelech is giving me strength. It's not just the Jewish people are giving me strength. I realized, I realized I'm not just looking to them for strength. They're actually looking to me for strength. I realized David HaMelech is looking to me to write my Tehillim today. I realized that the entire Jewish past is looking to me to give them strength. I realized that all the previous generations are gazing at me and pleading with me to empower them, to invigorate them, to remember that I am part of their story of our amazing past and our even more incredible future. And he said that this is true also about you and your son who's in a tunnel in Gaza. This is what Sharansky told this father. Why do you do it and I don't know how to do it? But there's probably a code, no? Oh. And now I have to share with you one more thing she wrote. This happened a few days ago. Okay, I got it. We're good. Noam Ramati is a commander and he was with his soldiers in a, in a neighborhood, in a region in Gaza and they were in the middle of a very intense campaign against Hamas. Noam Ramati is a Jew who puts on tefillin every day. One day they were fighting all day and he couldn't put on tefillin. He simply didn't have the moment to stop and put on tefillin. And he saw that the sun is about to set. It's going to be nighttime. And he felt very bad. All the soldiers could see his pain. Although most of them are secular Jews, but they saw the pain of their commander, Noam Ramati, and they said, why are you in pain? He said, it's the first time since his bar mitzvah that he's going to be missing a day of tefillin. He never missed a day of tefillin. It's going to be the first time since his bar mitzvah. Now, mind you, the tefillin were literally like 20 feet from there, but you were not allowed to move. Moving could literally endanger anybody's life, and certainly you couldn't go and retrieve the tefillin and put them on it was simply not possible. So he didn't put on tefillin. Now you call this the quintessential halacha of oynas rachmana patri. Somebody who's an oynas, which means you, you simply you don't have the ability. <laughs> like Nassim Sharansky in Siberia, in, in Siberia also didn't put on tefillin and couldn't blow shoifer because you're an oynas. You simply can't. You're in a war and pikuach nefesh is doicha everything. So you're not, you're, not, you're not allowed to even put on tefillin. That was the situation. But he still felt bad. I want you to know what happened the next morning. <laughs> the next morning, things calmed down. So you know what happened? All the soldiers in the entire platoon, was a huge amount of soldiers, came to him, and they said, this morning we're putting on tefillin together with you. <laughs> and everybody put on tefillin with him that day in order to help him feel better about the tefillin he missed last today. So today, many, many more tefillins were added. These are the people we're dealing with. These are the people, you're talking about the secular soldiers we're dealing with. Soldiers who didn't grow up with tefillin. These are the people you're dealing with. So if this is our perspective on Dosan and Aviram, and it doesn't whitewash Dosan and Aviram, that's not the point. But it shows you perspective on how Yiddish guide views someone whose only mitzvah is, I care. I care, I'm misguided, I'm misinformed, but I care, I have a heart. And that's Dosan and Aviram. Never mind today. When almost everyone who's not, doesn't know about Yiddishkeit, it's because of Tinoikas Shanishbu. Almost everyone, probably 99.9. And when you see such mysterious nefesh, such commitment, such dedication, how it behooves us to think about them, to pray for them, to connect with them, to be there for them, physically, emotionally, spiritually, on every level, when you meet one of them. I always tell my students, you're walking and I tell you, meet a soldier, stop, say thank you. Tadaraba, let me buy you a falafel. Let me buy you a lafa. Let me buy you an ice cream. Give him a hug. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. How can we thank you enough for this literally sacrifice day in and day out and with so many young boys and fathers who have lost their lives in recent weeks? I want to conclude with a letter.
Yeah. Yesterday, as you know, many young men lost their lives in Gaza. One of them was Elkanah Wiesel, 35 years old. He was killed yesterday in Gaza, Rabbi Elkanah Wiesel. And, uh, you know, they write letters before they go in to their loved ones, just in case something happens, Khalilah. So they found his letter. He writes, if you're reading these words, something happened to me. If I was kidnapped, do not make a deal for the release of any terrorist to release me. Our overwhelming victory is more important than anything. Please continue to work with all your might so that victory is as overwhelming as possible. Maybe I fell in battle. I wasn't kidnapped. When a soldier falls in battle, it's sad. But I'm going to ask you all to be happy. Don't be sad when you part with me. Instead, touch hearts, hold each other's hands, and strengthen each other. We have so much to be proud and happy about. We are writing the most significant moments in the history of our nation and the entire world. Please be optimistic, be happy. Keep choosing life all the time. Spread love, light, optimism. Look at your loved ones in the whites of their eyes and remind them to love too and be grateful too. The letter gets cut off. Yeah. Oh, okay, I don't know. All we could conclude is and say, we love you so much. We are in admiration of each and every one of you. We are grateful to you for eternity. All the Jewish people get our strength and energy from you all the way from Avram Avinu till Mashiach. And may Hashem bring a complete victory to all of us, to our people and to our nation, and a complete redemption. Take it from Yad Mamish now. Thank you. Have a wonderful and beautiful week. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Yes. Next week we're on Be'ezir Hashem, 9.30 on Tuesday.